Labour have failed to shut this down. And I don't think it's going to go away until it's resolved one way or another. There are clearly still questions outstanding that remain to be answered. Um, and they're going to have to be answered eventually or else this will just drag on. After days of journalists and also Conservatives asking for details of Angela Rayner's living arrangements and tax obligations, this is all, of course, about the sale of her council house nine years ago, Greater Manchester Police today say they've launched an investigation. Well, let's just find out exactly what's happening. Here's The Times' Patrick Maguire. When Angela Rayner declared her candidacy in the election, she declared that she lived uh, in a house on Vicarage Road in Stockport. Uh, but the contention in Lord Ashcroft's biography is that she wasn't living there. Now, the Electoral Commission says you have to declare your permanent home address. There's a lot of debate over what Angela Rayner's permanent home address was. And if, indeed, she wasn't living at her permanent home address, or rather she hadn't declared her permanent home address, uh, then she may have broken electoral law. That's the contention. Well, Patrick's comment piece in The Times that he wrote before this piece of news was kind of questioning whether Angela Rayner's tax affairs are sort of clouding an otherwise very successful campaign from the Labour Party. Let's get into this and the other political stories of the day. Joining me uh, to do that are Kevin Schofield and also Katrina Stewart. Thank you both so much. Um, Kevin, do you think that you know, Patrick's got a point. This is sort of creating this haze that's quite difficult for the Labour Party to push through. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you saw um, Keir Starmer's irritation yesterday. He's been interviewed um, and he got quite ratty. It was almost Jeremy Corbyn-esque um, when he kept being asked about the Angela Rayner issue rather than what he wanted to actually talk about. Um, and there's no doubt that Labour have failed to shut this down and I don't think it's going to go away until it's resolved one way or another. There are clearly still questions outstanding that remain to be answered um, and they're going to have to be answered eventually or else this will just drag on and it's a real nuisance for Labour because I know from speaking to people, quite senior people in the party, that their plan for the general election is to have Keir Starmer, uh, Rich Reeves and Angela Rayner fronting that campaign. So they want her to be very prominent mm. in the campaign. They think that she is um, a vote winner. But, you know, this will they'll just be getting asked about it again and again and again until um, it's resolved. So, yeah, it is, um, it's a bit of a drag anchor on, on Labour right now. Katrina, is it fair that the questions keep coming? I think Labour have handled this really badly. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago in this segment. And I think that the messaging that was coming from Angela Rayner and Keir Starmer was basically, we're confident that there's nothing amiss here. We're not going to prove it, though. You're just going to have to trust us. And I think you can say to voters now, after years of shenanigans and scandal and very disruptive political times, you cannot simply say our consciences are clear and we're, we're you just have to go along with it you have to you have to show your workings and Angela Rayner very early on said well I'm not going to show my my tax advice because there are those in the Tory party who have more complicated mm. tax affairs and they're not showing theirs it's not really a mature or, or a credible position to take yeah. and I think this is quite an easy attack line uh, against Angela Rayner because her whole shtick is that she is a, a from a working class background, she is relatable to voters. She's a straight talking, straightforward person. And now there is this whiff of scandal, whiff of confusion, and the the right wing press are not going to leave it alone. And Keir Starmer getting snippy in interviews is certainly not going to help. Yeah, he was. De I mean, he was definitely irritated. I think you put it quite politely, uh, Kevin, yesterday. The, the, the challenge is, Kevin, from the Labour Party, they want to draw very clear dividing lines between them and the Conservatives. And having thrown so many allegations of sleaze at the Tories, why was this not kind of a golden opportunity for them to say, look, hands up, if we've made a mistake, we own it, we're coming clean with that straight away, uh, and sort of be upfront and transparent two weeks ago? Well, I think the problem is that, obviously, this came from a book by Lord Ashcroft, and before publication, he obviously went to Angela Rayner and said, look, these are the allegations that I'm going to be making in the book. What do you have to say about it? Now, this would have happened months and months and months ago. Mm. Her response is in the book. It's there in black and white. And that really seems to have locked her into a position. Um, now, the, the line then, as it's been all along, is I've done nothing wrong. I've 
received legal advice and tax advice and I've done everything's above board. There's nothing to see here. Now, if they then try to change that position in any way, then that means that Angela Rayner wasn't straight way back when she was first asked about it. So I'd imagine there's quite a lot of irritation in the leader's office, really, that um, Angela Rayner's um, team didn't lock it down then. I don't know if they were warned, if the Keir Starmer's team were warned that this was coming when the book mm. um, was, was published. Um, but they've definitely been on the back foot on it all along. I think the only thing that saved them is it's quite a complicated story. You know, it's not an it easy is. one. It's not, like, it's not like Partygate when it was dead straightforward about breaking lockdown rules and other... Um, political scandals. This one, it's a tough one, even for journalists to try and yeah, get. Yeah, who heads lived where, well. when, what they should have paid, and whether it was your Totally. main residence. It is, it is complicated. Um, it is complicated Katrina, yeah. that part of this, look, I'm sure Keir Starmer will be pretty irritated that this story has overshadowed his his main announcement today. Um, the promise to say, you know, if and there were some caveats to it, but the the main aim to spend 2.5 percent of GDP on on defence spending. If we just get into that for a moment, what we're actually seeing is a very close aligning of Labour Party policy to the Conservatives. Yes, it's close aligning. But also, if you think back to the most recent budget, there wasn't very much in that with regards to defence spending. And that had really irritated the right of the Conservative Party, James Heapy, who was Armed Forces Minister, uh, was a, a big advocate for an increase in defence spending. And he had stepped down over partially over concerns around that and now you have Keir Starmer saying that this is Labour's number one issue and making quite an interesting long-term commitment to this as well because it's such a marked departure from the party's position in 2019 which was to move away from nuclear weapons but now Keir Starmer is saying that the nuclear at sea deterrent will continue but also that he's committed to upgrades to the systems on nuclear submarines, which is basically a long-term commitment to defence spending. It's a decades-long commitment. And it seems very much that he's uh, he's positioning himself with this spending commitment, albeit there are caveats to it, that he's not afraid to annoy the left of the party, that he is confident in appealing to, to the right of the party. Yeah, and there was some interesting analysis today, Kevin, that says exactly to... Katrina's point that if you are sort of previously a maybe a younger core Labour supporter who cared about you know the planet and you feel a bit betrayed about you know the scuppering of the green investment plan maybe you're part of Labour's support who are extremely nervous about Keir Starmer's support for Israel that there are a few places now where do you think it seems that the Labour Party think they've got enough wiggle room that maybe they're taking that core support for granted. I mean, perhaps there is an element of that. It's always it's always a balancing act, isn't it? Um, when you're trying to appeal to as wide uh, a proportion of the electorate as possible, um, that you, in Labour's case, move to the right to try and scoop up Tory votes and you leave your left flank a little bit exposed. Now, I dare say there will be some of the group that you mentioned who will perhaps vote green mm. at the next election. I doubt, looking at the opinion polls, whether that's going to be enough to, to change the bigger picture in terms of the seats that Labour are likely to win at the general election. But, you know, further down the line, I think that's the type of thing that, that, that needs to be addressed, that Labour got their fingers burnt in the new Labour years when they um, were seen to basically take their core support for granted. Now, slightly different group I'm talking about here, but it's like your red wall voters, your traditional working class voters felt that they were ignored by Labour and obviously it all came crashing down for them. So they have to be a little bit careful. But um, but yeah, I don't think they'll be too worried. I don't think it's going to affect um, Keir Starmer's overall chances of becoming the next Prime Minister. But what you're saying, Kevin, is that maybe for the next time round that we go to the polls, people may feel a bit betrayed and say, look, this doesn't actually represent Labour ideals. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but th this was always this has always been the problem that's dogged all Labour leaders, um, and that you know you have your your core left of centre, left wing vote, but you in order to get elected, you need to obviously appeal to the centre ground and millions of people who in the past have voted Conservative and really are really in like pledges when it comes to defence, for an, for example. Um, 
So I don't think uh, Keir Starmer had much option really other than to match the Conservatives' um, pledge on the 2.5% spending commitment. And it's a real contrast, obviously, to the position they were in under Jeremy Corbyn, where his um, perceived weakness on defence was one of the main reasons that, he, mm. that they lost um, in 2019. Um, there's another story in the Times today, uh, constantly sort of flirting with the idea about his return to frontline politics. Boris Johnson now has apparently refused to rule out uh, an immediate return uh, to the fray. Told an audience in Washington he would re-enter public life only if he felt he had something useful to contribute. Um, shall we listen to what he had to say? This is what he told students at Georgetown University. Unlikely in the short term, I would say. I think only circumstances on which anybody should stand for, a, for election is if they really think that they have something useful to, to contribute. And if I did think that, then I, then I would. Katrina, I mean, will he, won't, will he, won't he? I think he just loves being asked. Well, he certainly does. He certainly does. It's uh, delightful to learn that he feels he's ever had anything useful to contribute to politics. But, you know, he, even in his resignation speech, he sort of trailed a potential comeback when he did his, uh, his classics heavy resignation speech in 2022. He um, compared himself to Cincinnatus, who was a Roman political leader and farmer mm, yeah. who returned to his plough, but then came back to Rome as a dictator. So, you know, he's trailed it. He enjoys the tease. I think um, it's a difficult question for Rishi Sunak because, you know, we're told that insiders say that Boris Johnson would only make a return if Rishi Sunak got on his knees and begged for it, which I think is would come in the shape of a personal phone call asking for him to come back. But why would Johnson help Rishi Sunak, given the, the history between the two of them? Yes, yeah, so I think they'd have to be some uh, significant sort of thawing of relations between the two of them. Uh, Kevin, I mean, we could have been in a situation, we still might see a few glimpses of Boris Johnson, where campaigning for the next general election, we have the Prime Minister, potentially with two former Prime Ministers on his side. Maybe not literally on his side. I'd be very surprised if uh, Rishi Sunak shared a platform with either Boris Johnson, certainly not with Liz Truss, because she is absolutely politically. He toxic. can hopefully rely um, on David Cameron. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Of course, there's so many, yeah. there's so many um, <laughs> ex prime ministers kicking around you. You yeah. sort of forget these days. Yeah, Cameron, I guess, could well be out and about with him. Um, but yeah, it's uh, there'll be a lot on the right of the, of the Tory party who get quite excited um, when they see Boris Johnson pop his head up and they still think that he is electoral gold. I'm not so sure the opinion polls back that up. Mm. I think that would much rather Boris just um, keep his mouth shut and go away, not least when he's it's describing his smoking ban as absolutely nuts, as he did in Canada a couple of days ago. So, um, so yeah, as you say, Boris Johnson loves um, the attention he loves teasing people, but I think he's right, actually, in that there's not there's no imminent prospect of him coming back to the House of Commons. Yeah, actually, uh, Katrina, on the smoking ban, you know, we're looking at a Conservative Party debating the idea of banning smartphones, banning smoking. It's almost where, in some ways, both of the two major parties have swapped policy ideas. Yeah, it is. It is a bit of a, a, a switcheroo. And it's an interesting one for the Tories because it just seems like uh, all of... Rishi Sunak's main pledges have failed or have uh, caused him enormous headaches like the Rwanda plan. So the smoking ban just seems like, you know, low hanging fruit, something that's easy to implement, but certainly going against conservative values generally and, uh, and gives Boris Johnson quite an easy uh, attack line for criticism as well. Thank you both so much for sort of just going through, running through the days, what's already been a very busy political agenda. That's Kevin Schofield from Huffington Post and Katrina Stewart from The Herald. Thank you.